He didn't, he didn't count it in. I gotta edit that shit later on. <laughs> oh, we're already recording. Sound like a South Park. Yeah, be episode. careful, be careful. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> Rune's putting us officially on the hot mic. We need one of those on air bu- signs or yeah. something. Rune, we're gonna go ahead and pause here so you can open up your beverage. <laughs> yeah, we're we're waiting. I am out thinking you tonight, bitch. <laughs> yeah. There is no new beverage. You saw me. I finished my monster and then put water in it. That is true. But he always has Who to. Who puts water into a monster can? That's I a mean, very strange behavior. Very questionable. We've got like 6,000 disposable cups right next to you. I need to, to rethink our friendship. Because of the water can thing? Yeah. With him. Is it like an environmental thing? No. <laughs> no, was... man. This guy, environmental? I, I don't know. It just seems kind of a weird thing to do. Come on. I don't it, know. It's very odd. You just, you, do you do that at home so at you, all? You, or? Finish, you finish a monster drink and you fill up water. Is that your way of measuring it? <laughs> no. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good answer. No, that's it's exactly 16 ounces. Look. <laughs> yep, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in his head, but you know what? It was right in front of me. It started turning around and like reaching for the cup. Though. That just screams incredibly lazy, bro. I don't want to be that guy. Chris, but have you seen I mean, me? wait, I, didn't he? Didn't he throw it away first? No, no. I no. did. I put it right here in front of me. That got really weird for it's me. It's an empty trash like, can. That oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ! I just I just remember. I like, wait. I thought I remember him throwing it away. <laughs> this is so odd. What's why? You want to restart the show? No, I'm gonna go. <laughs> we're gonna go with this. Leave it in. I want everybody else to explain to me why that's normal behavior. Oh man, <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> you would have been better with the environmental play. I've got to be honest with you right now. <laughs> uh, you could have, yeah, you could have passed for that guy. Does you... it taste like plastic? <laughs> <laughs> well, you both know me too well for me to pass for the environmental yeah, guy. Yeah. <laughs> I know you fart ethylene gas. Um. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> All right. So, uh, despite the disturbing start to the show, there is a lot going in the economy that wait, really oh, pissed me off to no end. Come on, man. Welcome uh, back to the yes. number one financial literacy podcast in the world. Yeah, that's Said Omar. That's that's a ruin back there. And I am Chris. Yeah. And uh, clearly we recycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be honest. Uh, this show is going to have a lot of vigor, a lot of energy. Yeah. We because, went headhunting. Uh, yeah. No, no. It came to me. Did it? I didn't want to kill anybody, but all this shit just came out, and I was like, motherfucker! Yeah. Every time. Um, it started off, you know, humble enough. I was driving to work, mm-hmm. and I was, you know, PCE, core inflation. Coming out. Coming out this week. Expectations are out. Jolts coming mm-hmm. out this week. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, you know what? We're going to have a good week. We have lots of data coming out. Lots of interesting bits of information to help us understand what the Fed's going to do because they have a Fed meeting coming up. Mm-hmm. And then... I started to listen to the tidbits of information that were leaked out, like Fed Chair Jerome Powell talking about inflation from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Jackson Hole. Was Brad Pitt and Kanye in the crowd when he was talking? You would think that they would be, right? I mean, Kanye Studio plus I mean, how many Brad people Pitt are there? there? How many people are there? I mean, it's got to be those two. Yeah. Brad Pitt, JP, you know, Kanye. Easy. Yeah. You say easy or easy? <laughs> you'll never know. Yeah, I guess you'll never know. <laughs> Jerome Powell also took it to a next level when he said that it takes time for the slowdown and rent rises to slow to show up in the Fed's inflation gauge. All these topics just anecdotally pissed me off to no end, but we'll get into why later on. The Fed's mester decided that he wanted to open his big fat mouth and she, said he, she sorry, some, that's right. Put some respect on her name. Her, her, her big fat mouth. I, I was looking at a picture for like an hour today. You think I would have <laughs> I would have known that. Um season of the rate hike uh, says that rate cuts may have to wait. Okay. So we don't like her, but I got some people, some other uh, FOMC members that I do like, and I know you'll like that I've quoted. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say one of them is not Neil Kashkari. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah. He's not allowed. Not Public him. enemy number one. And then of course we had a Fed may have destroyed the housing market by doing something by one of my favorite economists, Mohammed El Rain. Mm. What? So before the show, I was sitting with Odun, and I was like, you know, on his lap. My middle name is Mohammed. His name is Muhammad. I always heard that Muhammad is the most popular name in the world, so I Googled it just to... Wait, whose name is Muhammad? Me? Muhammad al Rain. No, oh, mine. Okay. I was like, Did Muhammad you really Al-Rain. ask if your name is Muhammad? Well, he said him, and I thought he was talking about me. I, I you don't, so you weren't listening to the show so at you, all? <laughs> yeah, you know your job is to listen to the show. Like, that's a fundamental part of it. Jamie would not do this to Joe Rogan. Yeah. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Joe, or, what, what did you say? Or, or Doug. Yeah, Doug. Doug definitely would not do this. No. Yeah. Come on, man. So... 
Guess what? It was number three on the list. Muhammad's number three now? Number three. You dropped down? Who's What's number one? Okay. Take a guess. Female name. I'll female, let you, I'll female just name is number one? Yeah. <sighs> Kim. Think, no. You got to think more like Hispanic, Spanish culture. Okay. That. Um. Maria. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listeners were waiting. They're like dragging, like, come on, man. And then number two, I had no idea. I don't even know what ethnicity it is, but Nushi. I'm sorry, what? Nushi. How, the, spell that? N U S H I. That's the number two most common name most in the world. Most popular name. And then fourth. Uh, Fuck thir- you. Call it bullshit. Let's call shenanigans. Everyone, let's pull this bad boy up. Yeah. We're going to do this right and now. Then, and then third. There's no way in the world Nushi third was, is number two. Third was Muhammad, and fourth was Jose. Yeah, Muhammad, Maria, and Jose, I buy new shit. All makes sense. Get the fuck out of here. I don't understand. Are you pulling this up, Arun? Uh, it's on fourbeers.com. Four bears? <laughs> four beers. <laughs> Number two is Nushi. 55 million. Get can, the can fuck out of here. Can you Google? Look, Muhammad's on there twice or three times in the top. Wait, four times in the top ten. <laughs> Different spellings. So if you add all those together, Muhammad's number one. Mohammed, Muhammad, Muhammad. Nushi, forename, user surname from Sanskrit, meaning sweet. Most prevalent in China. I had no idea. I would have guessed uh, India. Oh, China. China. That's a Nushi's a Chinese name? I would have guessed Indian, right? That That's weird. Yeah. Hey, don't call them weird, bro. I'm not calling the culture weird. I'm calling the statistics weird. Those are weird. 55 million one-star reviews you're dissing right now. Come on. I mean, they're not five stars. No, they're going to give us one-star reviews. Oh, you mean all the new she's in the world are getting united against yeah. the podcast. Yeah. I okay, guess terrible. There's nothing this. I can seg- never segue from that. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> like, what it's what hard. do you want me to do? Yeah. We talk about Goldman Sachs, talk about Zillow. Zillow's also a piece of shit like they are normally are, but they're doing even more piece of shit like antics now. We'll talk about uh, valuation reset in the market because there's some IPO stuff happening mm-hmm. as better stock crashes 90% because Saeed put this in the show because he knows I fucking hate their CEO. <laughs> <laughs> was it Vishal? Is what his name is? Uh, I forget his I forget his name, but he was famously known for laying off a majority of his employees in the most insensitive d bag way. Yeah, via yeah. Zoom. Via Zoom, yeah. But then he was, yeah, it was really arrogant. His recordings of it out there, and then um, yeah, historically low interest rate cuts could be over. Mm-hmm. Hikes, interest rate hikes could could be yeah, over. Yeah, and we got know. a new review. We did, yeah, yeah. This from our guy uh, Vic Ramirez. Actually, uh, we were exchanging. Uh, we had a little conversation back and forth. Uh, healthy discussion on monetary policy versus fiscal policy and oh. he's like you know i really enjoyed the conversation he decided to leave us a review i was like wow man you're so kind i didn't have to oh ask. so that whole story was just so you could take credit for it that's what that's what you just did i mean why do you gotta take it there it's because that's what you just did no it's just a healthy i exchange. am just stating facts a healthy exchange i had with a listener and they felt it was valuable enough to All give us right. a five-star review okay Let, let's get into so this first article has an audio component or a video component if you're watching us on YouTube where you should like and subscribe and smash mm. the what button? The like button. Like button. You can't just like. you got to smash it. Mm-hmm. According to CNBC, Fed Chair Powell calls inflation, quote, too high, end quote, and warns that we are prepared to raise rates further. Now, I'm going to play a clip from uh, CNBC in this article which accompanied it, but before I do, I want to give you some context. It was widely thought going into this that Jerome Powell, our Fed secretary, was going to use this as an opportunity to scare the consumer into causing fear of the market. Right? We're going to we're going to give them the fear that we are going to possibly raise rates again. That was known before he made the speech, and he did not disappoint. Now, the reason why many of you might be asking, why would he want to do this? Why, why would the Fed chair want to do this? Number one, this is the most communicative Fed chair we've ever had. Most of them don't speak as much to the public as much as Secretary Powell has. Number two, consumer discretionary spending is a lagging indicator and has not pulled back. The stock market seems relatively healthy, or at least does on the, on the surface anyway. And there doesn't seem to be a very big pivot in the indicators they're looking at, other than inflation has come down from over 9% to where it is now, just under 4%. Correct. So they're, they're worried that it's going to become sticky unless these other things start to happen, like rent and rental equivalent going down and all these other things. So this is what he had to say. And I'm playing it from my phone because we're having a little bit of technical challenges in, in the uh, studio. But uh, for those of you watching, you might not be able to tell the difference. 
Arun, if you're ready, here we go. Tighten policy significantly over the past year. Although inflation has moved down from its peak, a welcome development, it remains too high. We are prepared to raise rates further if appropriate and intend to hold policy at a restrictive level until we are confident that inflation is moving sustainably down toward our objective. We have tightened policy. So what he's trying to say is, hold on tight, America. We're not coming home anytime soon. No, that's exactly what he's saying. He's trying to establish that they're going to hold rates for a prolonged period of time, and they are prepared, in fact, to raise rates more. And on this statement, you saw the world in straight probability jump to a 20% probability of an interest rate increase this time. Correct. Same thing with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And 50% by November that you see a potential for 25 basis point increase on top of where we're at today. Right. And what Chris is talking about there is, so the World Interest Rate Probability Index for, um, from Bloomberg, I believe, right? Yep. And the Chicago Mercantile Exchange are you know two different places where people can go that give pr- some pretty healthy predictions on what the Fed's going to do at their next meeting. So far, during this last year and a half, they haven't missed. Both of them. Yeah, they, they've been, and they get they tend to get more accurate the closer you get to the actual meeting date because they're usually more kind of awareness and thoughts about what's going to happen because they've seen more data, and they've had more time to really talk to people in the markets. And yes, exactly. So the predictions get more and more accurate as you get closer. And so there's there's some reports that are set to come out, you know, later this week that Chris alluded to at the at the top of the show, that are really going to you know help them make their decision if you if you were one to believe that the decision hasn't already been made and for for the record i believe the decision has been made i we both do i don't think they're going to increase interest rates this particular meeting i do think they're going to keep the rhetoric of of them increasing rates at potential future meetings if they don't see more prints of statistics like pce like jolts that go the way they want to correct yeah especially with so the pc report that's set to come out the expectations for that report that were released actually have it coming up. So it went is going up from 4.1% to 4.2%. Obviously not a big jump there to, for it to be alarming, but ultimately what it what it means is for the Fed to officially back off. What they're going to need to see is an uh inflation come down at a fast enough pace or steady pace and be you know certain that it's not going to head back in the other direction. There's not going to be a resurgence in inflation. That And so far, a report like this, you know, damages all the work that they've done up until now. Well, not just this report, but they also have early expectations of GDP being well north of 5%. Correct. Which means that the economy is growing at an accelerated pace, higher than to call it a 2% healthy GDP growth. So now they're going to think, okay, if GDP is going up more than double what we think is a normal healthy growth, if core inflation or PCE is incrementally changing up and not really going down any further. And if the JOLTS report is still relatively strong, the jobs report, then they're going to say, okay, you know what? These things that were lagging indicators, maybe there's not enough pressure downward. Right. And you'll see foreshadowed later on in the show that we've talked a lot about how inflation is going to get sticky because you need rent and rent equivalent, home prices and rent. And by sticky, what Chris means is it's going to remain at the levels that they're currently at. It's going to get harder and harder to push that down. Um, think about if you're walking through sand. When you start walking, it's really, really easy, and then it starts to wear on you and bear on you, and you start realizing how much weight is on is on your feet, and it starts to pivot very differently. Walk into the water, and it actually sucks you sucks you into it over time and kind of buries you. Well, the idea here is is that if you don't get far enough out from the water, the current will pull you right back in and bury you back in sand. So and in this analogy... The interest rate, the inflation, is what they're trying to get away from. That's the sand. But the only way they can stop that is to increase interest rates far enough to push you far enough out to where the tide won't pull you back into it. Right. And Jerome Powell did come out and say at his press conference that we have reached restrictive territory, right? Um, Yeah, but that was very unclear to me. It means that we've gotten to a point where he thinks that we're beginning to restrict. Well, I I think part of it has to do with, so the Fed funds rate now is at 5.25% 5.25% to 5.5%, okay? Mm-hmm. And inflation is at 4%. So it's a, the Fed funds rate is higher. So it's going to put pressure on economic activity. It's going to put pressure on companies hiring and expanding, right? It's going to put pressure on, on, all, on all those things. So that is what he, he, 
he wants to see it have an effect. And this PC report and the jobs report coming up is really going to tell the story here. Can I ask you a r random question? Sure. So, I, you know, we've had a year, a little over a year now, Powell being front and center of the media and delivering his message with almost like a poker face, right? Yes. What are your thoughts on him? Do you feel like Jerome Powell is authentic and doing the job well, or do you or do you think that there's more at play? I think, is he good? Is he bad? I mean, what do you think? I think that he understands the assignment. He understands that, look, everyone is reading the tea leaves. Everyone, He's got to always leave every option on the table. I get you want him to be – very communicative, and this is what we're going to do. No, no, no. I don't want him to be as communicative as he is, but if you're going to be, I want you to tell people what you're going to do. Right, and look, I think it's pretty clear um, that he has told people what he's going to do, given the fact that the world interest rate probability and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange have not missed. No one, and the economy has continued to produce, mm. given, and the only reason why the consumer hasn't fully pulled back yet is because they said, we don't believe you. But when all along he said, look at the summary of economic projections. I've said that it's going to take till 2025. The terminal rate on the dot plots that all the FOMC members, you know, select has been within this range. We haven't been that far off. Right. So I think he's been very communicative and he's trying to tread very carefully to not shock the markets because that's the last thing that he wants to do. He's made that very clear. We do not want to shock the market. And what... He, him and all the FOMC members are trying to accomplish is they're trying to find what is considered a neutral rate. Okay. They want a little restriction. They want some downward pressure on economic activity and hiring and slowing things down because inflation is getting out of control. But it's very difficult to find that neutral rate because what that neutral rate means is the, the Fed funds rate, the rate at which they set for banks to borrow money, never gets too high to where you know, it's causing too much downward pressure and the economy just crashes, but also not too little to where it continues to stimulate the economy. And that little sweet spot is really hard to find. That's a hard job. Do you think it's possible to find that spot, the elusive economic G spot, and uh, not have a recession? Uh, no, not given all the indicators that we've seen. No. So you believe if Powell does his job well, a recession is unavoidable. I don't I think that it it's it's almost impossible for him to not trigger a recession given the fact that we had a very prosperous economy for 14 years and this is just inevitable. Okay. Follow up question to that then. And I'm going somewhere with this, so just bear with me. Mm -hmm. So if you think that the probability of avoiding a recession is low at best. Yes. And that a recession is necessary. Are you arguing that a recession is healthy? Healthy. Mm. Healthy for the consumer. Well, de definitely for people that are out there trying to buy a home. But right? not all consumers are trying to buy a home. Not all consumers are trying to buy a home. You're right. Um, I mean, that uh, obviously, most consumer, not everyone's in the same position, so that's hard to say. So the reason why I ask all these questions is there's a lot of debate as to his efficacy, if you will. How effective has he and his reign been. And I don't know that we're ever going to have an answer in the near future. It'll take us probably decades and somebody else being his successor before we really look back and know whether he did a good job or a bad job. But I worry about some of the things that are already being said. If you increase interest rates again, the banking industry is going to be hit in a way that I know will be catastrophic on some level it, to, to at least 25% of banks. I'm a banker. I have a bias. I get it. Not everybody likes banks. Not advocating for them. But this will have reverberating impacts to other businesses, other sectors, like housing, like loans. And I still adamantly believe a credit crunch is on the horizon, which will probably be one of the things that helps this recessionary economy kind of build. But I am worried that, that we've possibly gone too far. We're not looking at the data. But maybe he's just more experienced than me. He is obviously significantly older and less handsome. <laughs> right. Think of a credit – when Chris references that a credit crunch will ultimately help the Fed's cause here, the, what I think of when I see it is uh, I think of like a wrestling match. 
and someone is getting tired of, and they come and they tag somebody else in to come finish the job, like the teammate, that's what I feel like the credit crunch is going to do to ultimately get inflation back down. I watched that Joe Rogan Hulk, Hulk Hogan episode. So great. So good. Dude, so many stories of like the boundaries that they broke over time. The body, the damage they went through in the WWF. Oh my god! Can you imagine being in the WWF and everybody being like, "Wrestling's fake, bro," and then like you're actually physically just enduring these injuries? Oh man, I know. And and some of the injuries and like how little money they were getting paid back then. Like he was yeah. taking gigs for like ten, fifteen grand at one point. Yeah. You're like, because he didn't know any better. Yeah, no, he didn't. Yeah. Know. Wow, man. What a stud. <laughs> well, speaking of studs, let's get back to Jerome Powell. Uh, there's another article we got here from Market Watch. This came out of really the same meeting, but it was a different kind of uh, narrative, if you will, from the meeting. Jerome Powell says it takes time for a slowdown in rent rises to show up in the Fed's inflation gauge. And we have talked about this on the show at great length. So we'll bore you the full recap. But suffice it to say, the data that comes in from the rent collection data, uh, you know, agencies, if you will, and companies, it's coming from different sources. It's coming in at different times. It's very, very delayed. And it's a lagging indicator. So it's it's going to be inefficient data, six months behind. It's going to take time normally. And what needs to happen in order for it to come down, home prices need to come down. Because rent and rent equivalent are about 33 34% of CPI inflation. Yeah. And what that means, rent and rent equivalent, is how much, if somebody owns a home, how much could they rent that out for? So it's trying to be extra cautious of breaking down things in more detail because that's one of the things we want to get better on. We want to, yeah, focus on it. Obviously, I don't give a shit. And you know who's not helping that cause? <laughs> Who? Zillow. We'll get into it later. Zillow, those motherfuckers. <laughs> Jesus Christ. If I couldn't hate Zillow anymore, they play fuck around and find out with me. Dude. I, the, the the memes that were coming out, it wasn't even me. It was like society was memeing them now. I mean, f- forget the fact that it's like, I, 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 it's a stupid decision. It, just stu- dumb. Reckless. If you want to know why Zillow's data sucks, we're going to give you an article later on which explains why they fucking suck. Yeah, stay tuned. All right, so Fed Reserve Chair Jerome Powell on Friday said that the central bank is aware that rent growth is slowing down across the nation, but that it will take some time before that is reflected in the Fed's inflation gauge. Again, not new if you listen to the show, and this is exactly what we were talking about. Powell, in a speech kicking off the Fed's annual retreat in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, sitting next to Kanye West and Brad Pitt, noted... (laughs) That rent rises, a major contributor to overall inflation, again, 33 34%, somewhere in there, uh, have been slowing. But the gauge the Fed uses to measure price changes has only begun to reflect that cooling off. And what gauge is that, Saeed? PC. Core inflation, which Core inflation. is coming out this week. Yes. And if Saeed's supposition is correct, it may go the wrong way. It may go the wrong way, which is which is all kinds of bad news. All kinds of bad news. But it sounds like, at least in some context, that the Fed Secretary Jerome Powell may be expecting that and prepping us with his communication here. But you know what I think it'll expose? Because if it does go the wrong way, and we, we've mentioned this before. I actually made a, a reel on it. It was like one of the first reels that I made. It was, you know, how they chose to pause but the data didn't necessarily show that it warranted a pause. So it makes it seem like the pause was was predetermined, right? So Mm. so some of this data that comes out, if it's not favorable for a pause, you kind of question like, wait a minute, this doesn't really feel like you're being data dependent. It doesn't. And that that, that would probably be my number one criticism of the Fed. If you would ask me the same questions I asked you, which you didn't because you're rude, I would say that that has been a big criticism of Jerome Powell, in my mind, but is that it feels like a lot of the decisions were predetermined so much that the world is straight probability in Chicago, Chicago Mercantile Exchange got it right. But you also don't want a Fed that is overreactive either. No, I get it. But there's nothing wrong with choosing to overreact by not reacting. Yes. You know what? Mm, not really feeling comfortable with X, Y, and Z data. Mm-hmm. Let's wait a little longer and, th- and figure it out. Yes. But their propensity to do so in recent months has been one time to wait. And they almost foreshadowed they were going to wait before they even got the data in. Which, uh, which it doesn't make sense why they're in such a hurry, right? I don't know. It's That's like, weird okay, to me. F- like if the economy was in shambles, right? Or there's mass layoffs happening a- across the nation, then, okay, well, we got to get this right. Hurry. We got we to gotta fix it. Yeah. But right now, GDP, great. Unemployment, 3.5%. 
Like yet in the 1970s and 1980s, they raised rates at a pretty fast clip, but 25 basis points consistently every single time and or 50 basis points in the other recession every single time until they got to their their definitive final rate. But how long that that pro- that process for them took how long? How many years? Uh start to finish. A year and a half, I think, in the first one. And the second example was like in the 80s? Eight, eight or nine months. No, I want to say the 80s took longer. 80s probably took longer. But so I, I, the attempt, I guess. But they were fighting hyperinflation and they had indicators. I mean, I would say the economy is much more responsive then than it is now. Like, why not mm-hmm. take the same consistent cadence, this whole bell curve thing? The Fed has never explained that. Right. They've never explained that. And the whole market is pissed off because if you're in banking, you're saying, well, why do we go so fast? And. If you're not in banking, you're like, well, the treasuries aren't moving. Like, it's very polar. And the Fed, if they're going to be communicative, explain yourself, man. Mm-hmm. Like, you work for us, dude. Yeah, why the bell curve? Yeah, why? Yeah. Give me some logic. Some, give me some logic. So, uh, I guess I got. Finish reading before we start getting into that? Or you yeah, want to yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. What else you got going on here? I was just going to cite some of the other um, FOMC members. Let's get into the rest of this. There's a couple okay. more paragraphs, and then we'll go into the FOMC members. So, quoting again from the article, in the highly interest-sensitive housing sector, the effects of monetary policy became apparent soon after liftoff. Mortgage rates doubled over the course of 2022, causing housing starts and sales to fall and house price growth to plummet. Which is interesting. interesting phrase. House price growth to plummet, but not home values to plummet very key distinction very, very you're right because yeah. i think i saw something that said that uh i think the average sale price of an existing home is creeping up if not has already surpassed the sale of the average price of a new home yeah which, which is, is wild weird yeah so powell said after the fed raised interest rates last year mortgage rates doubled the 30 year mortgage rate is now at the highest level since 2000 this article says 2001 though i think that's actually incorrect based on today's data Growth in market rents soon peaked and the steadily and then steadily declined, Powell said. The slowdown in rents occurred due to higher interest rates, but also due to, and I'm quoting here, the softening in real household income growth over the past couple of years, he said. Now again, mind the words. Real household income growth, not declines. It just grew at a slower cadence. It didn't reverse course. Right. So, in July, the yearly rate inflation rose to 3.2% from 3% in the prior month. I believe they're citing CPI there. They are. The more than 90% of the increase in prices was due to rising housing costs. This is the sentence. I'm going to repeat it again. More than 90% of the increase in price was due to rising housing costs. This is why we have been so just insistent that home values need to come down. This is why Dave Ramsey is looking at me over my shoulder every single night. We keep the book there. We have believed from day one that this would ultimately be a big problem for what the FOMC and the Fed Secretary is trying to do. And in order to get to where they want to go, we knew that this, just from a statistical probability standpoint, if 90% of the increase in prices was due to the rising housing costs, Housing costs have to go down in order to get inflation to the target rate. Right. And the situation that we're currently in with the Fed needing this, because right now, initially, when they were targeting inflation, they were targeting goods inflation. They got that under control. Yep. When they got that under control, services inflation went up. Something that they can still feel like they can you know, put, apply a little pressure on and hopefully control uh, in the coming months. But housing They've never dealt with a problem like this where housing is controlling this so much and people haven't lost their jobs. No need for them to you know, put it back on the market and sell. 92% of homeowners have a you know, mortgage of under 6%, right? So that they're stuck, man. Something's got to give. And people forget that a seller is also a buyer generally. Correct. If you're going to sell your house, you have to buy somewhere else or you're going to go somewhere else. It's got to make sense. If rents are high and rates are high and home values are high, what are you going to do as a seller? Right. Something's going to break. And continuing on from the article, and this is the article's language, not mine, not Saeed's, and definitely not Arun, who's very quiet tonight. Mm-hmm. The Fed wants to get inflation a year at a yearly rate of 2%. And Powell, 
Jerome Powell is prepared to raise interest rates further to get to that target. But the he himself even acknowledged that the way the Fed measures housing inflation has lagged private data sources. Lagging private data sources. Mm-hmm. Rents fell 0.7% in July as compared with last year, according to Apartments List. I don't even know who that is. Rents fell that month for the first time since early in the pandemic. And the the company said, July is the latest month for which data is available. In July of 2022, rent rises were running at 12%, according to RealPage Market Analytics. Yeah, man. That's a lot to take in in just a couple paragraphs. Right. And I should point out, if you hear like a weird sound, um, I actually have a beer that's frozen. And it's got a big chunk in the middle, and I keep drinking it. Yeah, he's making clicking sounds and stuff. That's me. That's you. <laughs> I'm sorry. It may interfere with the quality of the show tonight, but uh, Daddy needed a beer. Daddy, yeah, Daddy needed a beer today. Yeah, Daddy <laughs> needed a little bit of the uh, the alcoholic beverage. So then we think it's uh, the the next logical step to take from here is to discuss some of the some of the team players. The FOMC. The FOMC. So the you know we largely talk about Jerome Powell because what he has to say matters the most that's lebron right that is exactly that's lebron yeah. you wait to hear what he has to say a little but, older a little wiser been in the league for a while right he's he's the guy you're going to talk to in the post game yeah exactly he's the guy but the team is made up of a bunch of other players bravo chris for thank the, you uh, sports reference that was one of two nba players that i currently know no stop yeah. it chris <laughs> i gotta be honest i don't really know a lot of them anymore Come on, as a me. guy who used to watch like sports all i the know time. you i know you know more but I, i'm curious to know the ones you're gonna name so go ahead give me five Oh, give me give me a ten. No, 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 ten. Yeah, that's a lot. I, I I swear to God, I'm not overstating. Like I'm not. You don't not, know who's retired and who's not. I don't. Like is Chris Paul retired? Still playing. Still playing. Okay, Chris Paul. There you go. On the Warriors. Oh, really? This year? Yeah. No shit. Yeah. I don't I don't, I don't know if Adam's too happy about that. <laughs> yeah, Adam Adam is <laughs> probably not happy about that. Okay. Um, is Chris Bosh still playing? <sighs> Stop it, man. What? No. That was, like, how many years ago was that, Odun? Is he out? Uh, he was on the Raptors, right? Yeah, he was on the Raptors. Yeah. And then I saw Vince Carter retired. It was it made me sad because he's, you know, the old. Uh, yeah, you're literally players. talking about guys who played in the 90s. No, I know. I just, I'm obviously, you know, Steph Curry and everybody else is still active playing. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, everybody else. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like, <laughs> LeBron and Steph Curry, who else is there, right? Uh, who's gonna, how are you going to wear Jordans and act like you're, like, into this, like, basketball hoop life and no, no, ball's no. life? I don't wear any period correct Jordans. Oh, okay. I only wear Jordans from the '90s. That's it. <laughs> I wore my I wore my is, threes. Huh? Who, who is blank freak? Oh, um, you got to know that. Uh, the yeah, Greek guy. He knows. I didn't want to. Yeah, give him you the said he said the Greek word. guy. That's yeah, it. the Greek guy. Yeah, yeah the Greek freak. Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Giannis. Remember. Giannis. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna. He, put your he last name. honestly, aesthetically, I feel like he's underrated. That guy. I've seen a couple of, of games, like clips and highlights. He's not underrated. He's he's he, rated he's rated as one of the top three best players in the league. And I, and I would say just for not even not even like his like physical ability, but his like the mental awareness of the court is impressively good for his age and demographic. You know what is the most impressive thing about him huh. is how like his uh, durability. Well, he, look at his body. His physique is incredible. Well, the way he plays, he plays like so like so much force. That like, how is this guy not getting injured? It's crazy. Yeah, and that's what happened to, to Baron Davis. Like, when remember that last game at UCLA? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the guy, the incredible conditioning and shape for a guy yeah. his height. And people don't realize when you're how tall is this guy? Like six ten? What is he? Six eleven. Six, six eleven. So a guy this height to have that level of muscle mass, mm-hmm. that is so much fucking work. So much work. Something that he, one one story about him that I want to share that I thought was really cool. Uh, seven three. That's not real. Oh, it's that's wingspan. not true. It's wingspan. Oh, okay. It's wingspan. Um, story that uh, I have to share with him because I just think it was it was so cool. Um, he had he told the story after Kobe passed. He said he sat down with Kobe and he always reached out to Kobe to challenge him. Give me a challenge. I want to and I want to go out and do it the following year, right? Kobe challenged him become the MVP of the league. The following year he went out and he did it, right? He, he went back. He said, "What can I do next?" He's like, uh, "Go out and win a championship." Went out and did it. Right in Milwaukee, very difficult to do out there. Right, unheard of, man. unheard Crazy, of. Right, only man. did it one other time with Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Right, yeah. then he goes back after the championship and he says, "What can I do next?" He says, "I'm gonna give you a lifelong goal." He goes, "Okay, never stop being a kid." He's like, "Kobe, what do you mean? Never stop being a kid? I know I'm playful and fun, but what, what does that mean?" And he's like, "No, no, I'm not talking about like being playful and having fun. Kids are always curious. They never stop asking questions. Never stop trying to figure it out." 
never stop being a kid. Mm. And I thought I was like, wow, I've never heard somebody give some advice like that. That's awesome. Your love affair with Kobe is palpable. <laughs> I yeah. mean, your hate for him is palpable. No, no, I, I didn't. I don't hate him now. I hated him when he was playing. I had um, for the same reasons that a lot of people hated Jordan. No, 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 no. I, I respected his athletic ability the entire time he's in the league. Mm-hmm. But I always felt that there was a level of arrogance to him, and I'll never forget when he was in was it Colorado and he was accused of the whole like oh, weird thing of the girl. Okay. Right. He did a press conference. His mannerisms, the way he bit his lip, and and you could tell. He was more frustrated that he was being called out for what he thought everybody else in the league was doing than he was for doing something wrong. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I could see how somebody would take that way. I took it a completely different kind of way. Okay, fine. You want to yeah. play that game? I took it I took it as him being disappointed in himself, okay. letting his family down. Maybe. And you know what? I, I get it. There's a whole history of like his family like that, you know, yeah. that, that's out there. Uh, the rumor was that his his wife's family was going to sue him for statutory rape because his wife was underage at the time, and he was forced to get married to her. But I like to think that that's not true. And no, you yeah, know, I mean, yeah. And who cares? If you got married, you had kids, you had a great life, and a beautiful wife. Beautiful wife. I mean, you didn't you kids. didn't make any mistakes there. You know what I mean? No, no. And um, so what I'll say is this: is the articles that I, I heard from him post retirement uh, that I read about him post retirement from GQ. And some of the stuff that he did that he did and said that explained his behavior was really interesting because he was number one self aware of how he was perceived. He knew how people perceived him, mm-hmm. and he didn't care because he felt that, that was the sacrifice he needed to make to be who he was. And when you take it in that context, you look at it and you go, "Okay, that kind of explains Michael Jordan too." Uh, he got everything from Jordan, man. Yeah, everything. Uh, yeah, but and people always compare the two of them. They were trying to do all these comparison things, and I always loved how like the two of them never really like compared to one another they always should let's say with different generations mm-hmm. there's almost like a mutual respect but healthy competition between the two of them dude well, people don't understand so they were really really close and um kevin garnett actually went and visited the you know kobe bryant hall of fame at the hall of fame place they, they got a little section for him and um you know kobe wore the number 24 early like in his basketball career like in high school at some point and everyone thought, oh, that's why he's wearing 24. He's, remember, he switched from number eight yeah, he's to number one, 24. Yeah, he's better than Jordan. Yeah, but what KG came out and said, it was, he says, like, no, what everybody doesn't understand, he was taking a subtle shot at Jordan, like, I'm one better than you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's mentally ill. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love that kind <laughs> yeah. of shit. Yeah. Can't get enough. That's the kind of stuff I do to you every night here on the show. So do you love Messer? First of all, I thought it was a dude, so my bad. <laughs> Uh, according to Reuters, Fed's Mester sees another rate hike, uh, says rate cuts may have to wait. I was really pissed off when I read this, and uh, I'm going to give you a one short paragraph. Most Fed policymakers, including Mester, thought in June that they will probably be able to stop hiking. That was what we all thought, frankly. Uh, once they got the pet, the the pet, the Fed policy rate to the 5.5 percent to the 5.75 percent range which is one quarter point higher than it is today, Mm -hmm. which is scary. So now you got Fed Secretary Jerome Powell, who came out and said, hey, 25 base points might be necessary in the future. Now you have them actually talking about going from the 5.25% and 5.25% to 5.5% target range. It further feeds into the narrative that obviously Jerome Powell is talking about. And maybe Jerome Powell is talking about what Messer is talking about, that the Fed policymakers, most of the majority of them, felt this way. So Jerome Powell's out in front saying, hey, this might be necessary because he knows the majority of the people behind him in this committee of people who all collaboratively vote have this opinion. Right. So maybe Jerome Powell is stuck because he's saying, hey, look, guys, like I'm not, he may or may not think this is this might not be his vote, but he knows the majority of them have this perspective. Right. So it was frustrating to read that because it meant that more than Jerome Powell it's not him leading the charge. He's really reporting back. And if that is true, hence the reason why I asked the question, you know, do you think he's being honest? And if he is being honest, which I think he is, that means there is a a real, real probability. And this is why the World Interest Rate Probability and the Chicago, Chicago Mercantile Exchange went from a very low probability of an interest rate increase to 50% by November. Well, okay, so one, let's let's talk about this. And we've mentioned it on the show before. That uh, every every quarter, at the end of every quarter, the FOMC, uh, the group of people that makes these, de- these decisions, they release a report called the SEP. Hey, everyone, I got a present for you. Ready? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done. And it's my oh, can we pause for a second? Rune, are you even alive back there? Yeah. Dude, he must have really, he thoroughly enjoyed that Kobe and Jordan discussion. Yeah, he did. I know did he did. Did you really? Yeah. Bro, I wasn't even cutting. I'm going to be off to do that post. Got a chub, like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> got a chub. <laughs> I didn't realize you were that into it. I got to be honest. What do you mean? Sports what? Talk, man. Sports dude, talk. I mean, Arun and I, man, we're purple and gold blood, dude. What are you talking about? Well, then you guys will be very happy. I've ordered three pairs of Kobe's this week. None for, for me. Us? The Halos? No. The all white oh, joints? Shocker. The new proto, the proto, whatever they got, the color came out. All whites. All yeah. whites. I ordered those for a buddy who said, hey, I couldn't win them on the sneakers app. I got those for him. And then uh, uh, Chris, no, who's uh, from the Leverage, mm-hmm. he's been on the show before. He, um, his daughter wanted uh, two pairs: the the green pair and the black black pair. Oh, the Grinch! You know, yeah. you, you know, you know where those those came from. He, he debuted those on Christmas Day. Yeah, because he wanted to steal Christmas from somebody. Yeah, well, there you go. Love that. I ordered uh, both of those in a youth size six. What'd you get me? Oh, yeah, for Chris. No, what you you still you ordered everybody's shoes? You haven't got a ruined pair of shoes yet. The problem is Arun doesn't like shoes. He literally can't wear them. <laughs> you got gout. No, it's not that. What what is it then? It's the other it's the other toenail, the ingrown toenail, right? Oh dude? Yeah, but that's done. That's not permanent though. Like you can wear shoes at some point. He doesn't like wearing shoes. I mean you oh god, I just had a If I had nice shoes, I'd probably wear them. I just had a fucked up realization. I would I would pay good money to see Odun and some Travis Scott. Okay. So <laughs> Some really good money. Bro, I'd, some I'd really good five footed Travis Scott. I'll, I'll go. I'll go happies with you. I'll buy you some Travis knots. <laughs> no, you know what I want to get him? <laughs> what? The Ben and Jerry's. The Ben and Jerry's, the dunks. <laughs> yeah. I can get those if you want those. No, he doesn't. He likes ice cream. Maybe he'll wear them. What the hell are they? The Ben and Jerry dunks, bro. Put Pull them those up. up. Yeah, we get those on the screen. You're gonna think they're hideous, though, dude. Yeah, they literally come in a tub, like almost like an ice cream tub. And these are these are widely no, go popular to images. Shoes. Go to images. Yeah, Ben and Jerry dunks, baby. These these are uh, these are a big deal. There you go. Yeah, people love. these I can't shoes. believe these resell what? too. Pretty crazy. Crazy high price resell. Go to StockX on the top left. Top left. What the? No no bottom bottom bottom. No I know but I'm just looking at the price of this resell. That's Freddy Krueger. Those, those never released to the public. Those were like the forty grand. Yeah. Um, Chris, go down. Go down. No I can't. I actually don't. Actually I think I could probably get you a pair of those. I could probably get you a pair of the Freddy Krueger uh, dunks, but. It, my price Here, would probably be like around. Here's a problem. Here's the problem with Odin. Oh. You're gonna get them from him. He's gonna resell them. He's not gonna wear them. Bro, if you resold the pair, I got you. I would fucking never talk to you again. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, so wildly disrespectful. And I brought him into the conversation. <laughs> yeah. He was back there silent as shit. You were being the good guy. I was. I was like, you know what? This guy hasn't said a lot tonight. All right. I'm worried about him back there. Is he grunting? Is he doing the billy goat thing? <laughs> yeah. So, okay, back to this conversation. So at the end of every quarter, the FOMC members uh, release a report called the Summary of Economic Projections. Mm-hmm. And they discuss everything that they see. They discuss all the reports. They they bring it all together, and they give you a great, like, uh, summary of it all. And in that report, they release something called a dot plot. That dot plot basically references the 18 FOMC members and where they see the Fed funds rate ending up at, given the current you know market. The last time this report came out, which I believe was in June, right? There's 18 members. Two of the members thought that the rate would end at 5.25 percent. Well, they were wrong. We already passed it. Okay. <laughs> That's hurtful, <laughs> yeah. but okay. But we don't know who they were. I don't think we know who they are. One of them was not Neil Kashkar. <laughs> Probably not. That guy's the first guy in the dot plot at seven. Right. Four of the members thought that it would end at 5.5%, where we are now. Okay. I should point out the range is 5.2 to 5.5% currently. If they moved up 25 basis points, again, obviously, that would be 5.5 to 5.75%. Right. And... Um, Remember, when we say 25 basis points, that means basically just means 0.25%. I, had, I feel like we're going too granular there. No, I, I had some people reach out, and it's okay. It's, we're, we're just breaking it down. I'm going to do, Odun and I are going to do a whole video on this. On okay? BIPs? On, yeah, on BIPs, Fed Funds Rate, why it matters, the whole the whole night. And we're gonna, from now on, we're just going to be like, go check out our YouTube, and it's right over there. Okay? Oh, okay. There you go. I yeah, like that. We're going to do that. I'm into okay? that. Thanks so, for including me, you fucking... Dick. Well, we have to do stuff on our own to make you feel like we're being proactive here. Otherwise, you feel like you're doing all the work yourself. I never said that. <laughs> Stop. Christopher. To your face. Christopher. <laughs> okay, so four of the members thought it would end at 5.5%. Now, the remaining 12 members, 
thought it would get somewhere between 5.5% and 6%. 12? 12. So they were very- Son of a bitch. Christopher- what, what the names? I want the names of all of them. They were very, very clear- I want the names of all of them. Every they were, single fucking one of them. They were very clear where this was going, okay? <sighs> so with that being said, we heard what Messer- Daddy not happy. Messer from Cleveland said, I want to note that she does not have a vote. Okay. Yeah, she's like Neil Kashkari. So that's the other thing to Y'all point out. Y'all on the bench. You had great college careers. Yeah. Now that you're here, shut up and sit down. Go get my water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing we need to mention. There's 18 members. Only 12 of them get to vote. Okay. So I got some here from Fed President of Boston, Susan Collins, who is a voting member. She said, the Fed Reserve may need to raise interest rates higher. We may need additional increments, and we may be very near a place where we can hold for a substantial amount of time. Don't like Susan Collins. Don't like Susan Collins, right? She's out. But she's got a voting a, a vote, so it's kind of scary. So, like, this is why it's important to hear it because, okay, we know Jerome Powell has a vote, and he's the one in front of the cameras, but we should hear from the other people that have votes. What about John C. Williams? Man, fuck Williams. But I got, too? No, I got Patrick Harker, who I think you're going to like. He's a Fed president from Philadelphia. Philly. Love yeah. Philly. Love Philadelphia. Yeah. One of the best cities in, in America. Depends on what his vote is. Hold on a second. Go ahead. <laughs> he says, right now, I think we've probably done enough. Best city in America. <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> the rate increases are at a restrictive level, so let's keep them there for a while. I see us staying steady for the rest of the year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, and that goes alongside. Sounds like a fucking brilliant man to me. Sounds like someone who's very reasonable. Probably tapped in. Yeah. Knows the banking sector, knows the economists, the, yeah. you know, general consensus. Yeah. Probably feels like he's smarter than everybody else in the FOMC, but doesn't want to tell him. Exactly. So Smart he, guy. he feels like we've we've done enough and that, you know, eventually something will happen to the housing market. What you got over there? A segue for your housing market article. And I like want to see what you got. You don't got any names? No. That's I, it? That's it. Those are the two. I There's want... 12 members you gave me two? Well, that's the only two that I could cite. Yeah. This John C. Williams is a bitch, huh? Uh, you don't like him. New York Fed fucking president, motherfucker. New York, I think the New York Fed president is also the vice uh, chairman. So, like, he's he's always he always has a vote. So, oh, for those of you out there who don't know this, uh, probably a good time to show. So, the Fed secretary, Jerome Powell, is kind of like the bigwig, right? And uh, Williams would be his bitch. <laughs> yeah. He would, he's number two. Number two. He's, uh... The not, 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 not Commander all. Riker to the not Kirk. Not all vices are bitches. I mean, I never got to see that Cheney uh, movie, Dick Cheney. And, and for full disclosure, I would be the bitch at my job. <laughs> 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 that would be me. I mean, yeah. that's been proven. Yeah, uh, that, that's my job. <laughs> yeah. Team bitch. All right. According to the Insider, the Fed may have destroyed the housing market by crushing both supply and demand. Top economist Mohamed El Rain says, which we now know is no longer the number one popular name in the world. It's number three. I, but if you add all Oddly the other behind Muhammads, Nushi. If, you, if you add all the other Muhammads, it's number one. Yeah, there's so, Muhammad, Muhammad, yeah, yeah. Muhammad. Yeah, how come everyone's spelling it differently? Phonetically different. I, I, if you're going to be that serious with the spelling, I mean, it really should be number one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yours is uh, M-O-H-A-M-M-E-D? A-D. Good job, almost. A-D? Yeah. Muhammad. Yeah. Muhammad. Very Afghan way of saying it. Muhammad. You get very hairy knuckles. Every time I like slap your knuckles, it's, I, it's my way to pay it, tribute to Robin Williams. It muffles the sound. Yeah, <laughs> Robin Williams had some hairy. That's ass what I'm knuckles. going with. This is this is out of respect. God rest that man's soul. He was a great comic. Love him. God damn it. Better if you haven't seen Robin Williams stand up comedy. By the way, you owe yourself a favor. Go check out the vintage stuff. Yeah, if vintage you like, stuff is amazing. If you like Robin Williams for the acting that he's done, different man. You would never even believe the type of comic he was. Robin Williams is more like Eddie Murphy raw than he was like the Robin Williams you saw. Exactly. Yeah. But okay, given that, okay, we, we both appreciate his stand up. What's your favorite Robin Williams movie? Ooh. Another topic Odin's getting a chub over. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of him getting a chub is just a chubby guy getting a chub. It's just, it's very. He's, dude, he's cut weight. And for the listeners, 17 pounds. For the listeners, you guys need to send Odin some love. He's cut 17 pounds. And he's not on Ozempic, surprisingly. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Look, I, for the right set of circumstances, I might get on Zipic. I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing too well over here. Uh, that guy's lost 17 pounds. I haven't lost an ounce. Yeah. Well, my sister yesterday after breakfast was like, "Hey, no, seriously, are you on that or no?" I'm like, "No." 
That, that did not that, sound that, genuine at all. Hold on, you didn't sell no. that. No. <laughs> <laughs> you might be, dude. That's like every dude in Hollywood right now. You on Ozempic? No. Yeah, at this point, with with you on TRT and him on Ozempic, y'all both cheating. I need to get on something, bro. I can get you a sponsorship. Uh, uh, listen. I, Get us a sponsorship for the show first, and then give me a sponsorship. You know what? We will be sponsored by Transcend HRT, hormone replacement therapy for everyone. Ooh, mark it. Book it. We'll send that link to them in a reel. <laughs> <laughs> You'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll do the whole thing, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's where I get my, my stuff from, and they are pretty amazing. And they do have Ozempic, Arun, if you just, you know, you want to you know, lose a little bit more than 17 pounds. Yeah, because you want to remain healthy, right? Because you don't want to take days off from work because then you're using your PTO and then you're losing out money. You're not learning as much. You need to be working. Stay healthy. You sound take, real hard, aren't you? Is that take, what you're doing right now? Take Transcend. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. So going back on point, Mohammed al Rain said that uh, the U.S. housing market may be broken. And the Federal Reserve's aggressive interest rate hiking cycle over the past year could be to blame. You say it ain't so. Mm. According to this top economist, Mohammed al Rain, there, and I'm quoting here, there is a real reason, a real issue as to whether we've broken the housing market, the Alliance chief economist advisor said in an interview with CNBC on Monday, pointing to high mortgage rates weighing on the market. The average rate on a 30 year fixed mortgage notched to a fresh 23 year high. Hence the reason why I said 2000, not 2001, on the previous article last week. Clocking in at 7.48% according to Mortgage News Daily. And we have been very vocal on the show, Saeed Arun and myself, about this being an interesting year where you may see 8% rates by the end of the year. Firmly okay. believe it. September, October, November, December. Four months, you might see an A-handle. Mm-hmm. That's that's I, I would say that's more probable than not, and hopefully that does something to put some downward pressure on these homes. Maybe maybe not. Quoting again from the article: When you go from record low mortgage rates to levels that haven't seen we haven't seen for almost twenty years, you've destroyed both demand and supply. Dave Ramsey, mm-hmm. suck it. Yeah, and that's the irony: is that supply has come down and demand has come down as well. That is the way you destroy the housing market, all Rain said. We've got to be really careful because the housing market is central to the economy. And as we know from previous parts of this show and other shows, inflation. Central to inflation. Well, it not only destroyed demand, but it destroyed affordability because we know. Demand without affordability is in fact not demand. Right. And I would say this is kind of the paradox, if you will, of how we've gotten to where we are is that much like when you travel through time, right? If you mess too much with one variable, you can mess up the entire timeline. The housing market's not different, but we like to believe that it's different. We like to believe that it's independent of all these other factors, but we've messed with the one variable that can mess up the entire timeline, affordability. Right. And if homes aren't affordable, that means even if you want to sell to provide more supply in the market to meet that demand, where are you going to buy? And the answer is probably nowhere that's going to be anywhere near your current cost of living, especially if you refinanced in the last couple of years. Right. Exactly. I mean, something that a lot of people who aren't in the real estate space, I know that we a lot of our listeners are, but as the show continues to grow... We have uh, lots of we have people who work for places like Zillow and everybody else. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of people in the industry. A lot of people. For, a lot for of the, real estate agents. For those, Shout out to those guys. For those who Girls. are uninitiated, right? Those who are uninitiated. Yeah. Bane. Yeah. A long time. Um, so the housing market is a pivotal role, plays a pivotal role in our economy. Okay. It's it's, it's a big piece of the puzzle. I kind of feel like I just said that. So when people buy and sell homes, it really affects a lot of things that we care about. And it does, in fact, create a lot of jobs. There's a lot of jobs in this space. So as this continues to rates continue to go up and there's less and less you know, volume out there, it affects a lot of people. And here's I mean, just a few of the jobs that I could think of that I want to put together that it impacts in case like you're wondering, OK, I don't really understand how big this market is. It's everyone from appraisers, from title and escrow professionals to home inspectors to interior designers and home stagers, 
to banking and you know lending uh, professionals, building materials, and the retail stores that are affected by them. Home Depot, think Lowe's, right? You got your moving companies. You got your storage companies. I mean, the list goes on and on, man. Mm-hmm. So this is this is gonna f- really affect you know the overall economy. And shockingly, how is GDP five point eight percent right now? I don't understand. Yeah. I'm not even going to try to fake. That's going to understand. I don't. I legitimately do not understand. And and we know you just you know from just human behavior. I mean, think about how many shows are popular, like on HGTV, all those house at home shows. I've heard, I've heard that this pop in GDP is literally Barbie, Oppenheimer, Beyonce, and Taylor Swift. Come, that can't be, man. I that that's the rhetoric. I mean, I'm going to wait to see the data, and I'm going to wait to conclude based on you know real solid quantifiable data, but. That's that's the shtick. That, our, that's what's out there. That's that's, guy, the, that's the zeitgeist. That's the world right now. Our our guy Schultz is in headlines again. Andrew <laughs> Schultz. Yeah. What do you say he, now? He said he's like Taylor Swift, man. She's so amazing. She oh, I saw that. Yeah. She can't. She you can't compare her to Beyonce. Beyonce is not on her level. He said he went hating the idea that he was going. Yeah. Didn't want to go to the show. Yeah. Went and was fucking blown away. Fucking blown away. And he said, I believe it, dude. He's like, dude, you you can't compare Beyonce to Taylor. Taylor can only be compared to Michael Jackson. Yeah, that's the level that she's on. He came out hard, and I think he was being honest. Yeah, man. I think no, he's being I don't honest. Think so. I don't think so. I think he knows what he's doing. He was trying to create controversy. I mean, maybe trying to get a date with Taylor Swift. No, he's married, man. Is he really? Yeah. What's his name? Uh, no, man. What? Um, married, and I, I I was listening to something the other day. Married and no prenup, and he was like, "Pure love, baby." That's what he was saying. Huh. Hmm. So his name is what? I don't know her name. I, he she was, he was keeping her like under wraps for a long time because she didn't want to be in the public eye like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, she was like she's got getting her like her master's degree in something in business. Oh, good for her. Yeah. Oh, Who was her. Andrew Soltz's wife? Learn the story of Emma Turner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she looks very normal. Yeah, I mean, she does not look like a comedian. No. <laughs> <laughs> no she looks cool. I mean, I yeah. Guess. I can, and then I was like, I can't name um, a single Taylor Swift song. Personally, shake it off, bro. Shake it off. Shake it off. Okay, I mean, when you say shake it, it off, yeah, yeah, okay, I know, yeah. I know the songs. I've that obviously heard them. I can't think of any of the titles, and the only one that I could think of is the "We Are Never Ever Ever." This is going. I really feel really bad me. about my shake it off thing, and then you said that, and I feel totally fine now. I'm totally. <laughs> I, I can't even finish it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting those, back together. Those are the reels. <laughs> yeah, those are the reels. For me. <laughs> yeah, that's a reel. Mark that down. Fifty-seven twenty-four into the show. <laughs> <laughs> and then one other thing that um, Muhammad El Rain also wanted to mention is something that we haven't talked about a lot on the show as of late, but we did reference. Um, you know, previously over the last couple months, is the real fear here is stagflation. Stagflation, baby, which ironically was what the fear was when we started this whole interest rate, interest rate increasing cycle. Right, man. So, uh, it, uh, uh, can you define inflation and can you define stagflation? Because they are very similar. They are very similar. So, stagflation ultimately is when you have slow economic growth while having rising inflation and rising unemployment. Arun, there is a great chart on stagflation versus inflation. If you could pull it up, mm-hmm. uh, Google that real quick. It is it is probably the most visible and easy to understand way of articulating this. So for those of you who are not following, it's the third one, uh, fourth one. There you go. Over there you go. Right, perfect. This one, in my mind, is the best way to visually represent exactly what we're talking right. about. Right. So here. what I said: slow economic growth, rise in unemployment, and rise in inflation. I mean. So, Obviously, you don't have. There's no demand because when you're unemployed, there's less consumer spending because you don't have the the funds to go out and spend. So, to, to, the way I like to explain this is a recession is GDP going down, unemployment going up, and demand going down. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, stagflation is everything that would be normally recessionary: GDP going down, unemployment going up, and demand going down, with inflation going up. Right, and and. The whole demand going down is really just a function of GDP going down and unemployment going up, right? Because obviously, if unemployment goes up, you have less discre- discretionary spending out there. You have less funds to go out and spend. So it's really not that demand is going down. It's nothing is affordable to you anymore. Exactly what we've talked about on the show, mm-hmm. right? So that aspect of it, you, we can almost do away with. 
It's really just GDP going down, unemployment going up, and inflation going up. Sorry. Yeah, that's kind of hurtful. That's fine. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Just totally diss the classic definition, but you could be worse. You could be fucking Zillow. <laughs> Not could literally fucking, fucking Zillow. Zillow. <laughs> yeah, you could be those motherfuckers Zillow. Uh, How, yeah, is that yeah, no yeah. motherfucker? I don't know. It's very confusing. My lead in for this is Jesus fucking Christ. That's how I felt when I read this. And then as I read it, I got even more pissed off. So let's just let's just throw throw ourselves back in time. Michael Burry uh, went to medical school. Got into trading, left the practice of medicine, and, and was one of the people who called the Great Recession. Made a ton of money. Billions shorting the market. A lot of millions. A lot of a lot of millions in those billions. Yeah. And uh, he's shorting the market again. But not to the extent that he did in the past, but he's certainly shorting it again. He's one of many people sounding the alarms, ringing the bells, concerned. Certainly Noriel Rubini. He's worried about the economics <laughs> from his hot tub, top of his illegal placement of it on his uh, rooftop penthouse in New York. There's a lot of people that are out there. Peter Schiff. Broken clock is right twice a day. He hates that. That's why I say it every time. But yet somehow Zillow finds a way to fuck up. Fuck around and find out once again. This is so reckless. Zillow debuted its 1% down payment program on Thursday. Agreeing to contribute an additional 2% at closing in an effort to, quote, reduce the time eligible buyers, home buyers, need to save money. End quote. The real estate marketplace said in a statement. Right. Basically what they're saying is for people that don't have the funds to save up enough for a down payment, we got you. You can put 1% and buy a property. Continuing on, quoting again, most markets are in the midst of an affordability crisis and saving for a down payment remains one of the biggest barriers for many potential home buyers, end quote, Zillow said. The same day, mortgage rates in America hit their highest level since 2001. Why, you ask? Since they sucked so much at eye buying, you recall they shuttered the entire division and took a massive economic loss. The fucking genius behind Zillow. Zillow's 1% program could also be a way to win back business after two years of declining sales. Or you could be repeating the same stupid ass mistakes that got home buyers into homes leading up to the Great Recession. The company's now shuttered home flipping business. Zillow offers lost a staggering $881 million in 2021. For the entire entire fiscal year, this is a perspective on the genius that is Zillow now. For the fiscal year, the entire fiscal year. The company posted a net loss of $528 million and laid off about 2,000 staffers, roughly 25% of its workforce. In 2022, Zillow reported $101 million in net losses. And are you ready for the real chub action here? $1.95 billion in annual revenue, an over 8% dip from the previous year. Right. So this is actually going to be available to eligible borrowers in Arizona at first. Yeah. And, and then, then they're going to roll it out to other people who are going to likely default in the not too distant future as well. This is so wild, man, because the whole concept of a down payment for the lender, right? Because this is, I know everyone views Zillow as like a place where they go check home values and see the place uh, where like um, which houses are listed on the market. Yeah, but right? if, you're, if 66,000 realtors, over 66,000 over 66, 66, realtors have left their profession this year alone, their main source of revenue is selling data to realtors. Yeah. They have to spin their data in an optimistic way. Now, this is a way to try to get more business for their realtors, who then in turn pays them. It, it's just it's right. wildly reckless. Why, and, it's, and it's reckless because the whole system, right? When you, as a lender, you give somebody a loan, you want, you need to make sure they have skin in the game, mm -hmm. right? That's the whole point of like why lenders will require you to put, they'll give you favorable pricing if you put 20% down, right? Because you have more skin in the game. You're not just going to walk away. Let me paint a picture for you. 
you only put 1% down on, you know, on a home. And let's just say six months from now, prices go down 10 to 15%. And then on top of that, you lose your job. What's that bar we're going to do? Walk away. Yeah. I got no skin in the game. I and guess what? 10,000 in this million dollar home. And guess what, Zillow? You got to eat the loss, dude. Yeah. It's fucking reckless, man. Take that sandwich and eat it. And then you know what? Why? Why else it's reckless and why it's terrible for the economy? Obviously, it's not their job to care about Jerome Powell and his mission, but obviously these these uh, first time home buyers that are out there, they're going to come out and you know take advantage of this in Arizona. What's it going to do? They're going to put upward pressure on prices, go after a home, which is what they want. Because keep in mind, so Zillow caters to realtors, right? Right. What is realtor's solution to the affordability crisis? Rates have to go down, not values, because they get paid off the, the commission they get on the highest possible home price they sell it at. Right. So this is a way of Zillow propping up home values artificially in light of affordability instead of rates get, you know, cutting down or home values coming down. Right. It's fucking nuts, man. It's nuts. So I'll wrap this up with one last stat about this. Wrap which, that up hard. Which is just bonkers. So hard. This, and mind you, this data is from Zillow. 64% of first-time buyers are putting down less than 20% on a new home, okay? Maybe not that alarming because it could be anywhere between 1% to 20% to twenty Now check this out. 25% of those first-time buyers are putting down 5% or less. Yikes. Not good, my friend. Not no bueno. Good. No bueno. Anyways, I, I think we save this our this article for the next one and we wrap this up with a review. What do you say? You want to skip the our favorite CEO in the world, David Solomon? We got I mean the listeners we I've looked at the analytics. All right, if, if we're gonna push this off, then I will say there is something I did not add to the show notes, which um I think was interesting. Okay. I found an article which I'll have to find again because I didn't put it in the show notes that talked about all of the CEOs at Goldman Sachs going all the way back to the Goldman's and the Goldman and Sachs families. Okay. And it was actually really fascinating to see where they went after they left Goldman Sachs. Oh, interesting. Really interesting kind of history that I, I didn't see coming when I read the article. Similar, so I'll find, I'll similar, find similar paths? Or? Yeah, no, no, no. Very different and very unique and very high profile, all of them. So very interesting story. I don't want to spoil it because there's some interesting kind of departures. Like one went to Ronald Reagan's office and one yeah. went to another president's office. You know so where David Solomon's going to go? Co that? Coachella. I feel like, yeah, he'd be <laughs> DJing Coachella. Definitely um, really into cold plunging. Easy. Easy, right? right. He, he's a guy who's like, look, I give him the cold plunge. Microdosing. And um, I take my, my microdosage of mushrooms. <laughs> and I can sit in there for 45 minutes. He's going to wear pearls as a necklace? Diamonds and pearls. No. Would you ever rock a pearl necklace? First of all, like no disrespect to anybody who does. What? Okay. Why? I know your cousin I'm wears just, it. I'm just and it looks good on him. <laughs> uh, he rocks it. He, he rocks the shit out of he it. He does. And I've seen a lot of dudes who I feel like they think they're kid cutting. You know why? You know what? why? I, I will I will never say a guy rocking a pearl necklace is bad. Why? Because uh, what's his name? Stylebender. Odin. What's his What's his full name? Adesanya. Adesanya. Israel Adesanya? Yeah. What in the fuck are yeah. you saying to me right now? Bro, he's like one Jeez. of the greatest UFC fighters of all time. He walks around with a pearl necklace. I'm like. I got nothing bad to say. I have no idea who this is. What? Yeah. You, I have no idea. you, a guy who went to a UFC match, you don't know who Israel Adesanya is? Oh, I had to sit next to somebody who was telling me what was going on. <laughs> really? I had no clue. Yeah. Oh, this guy. Oh, this guy looks like a stud. Yeah. I, yeah. I know this guy is. Yeah. yeah. I think he's wearing it right there. He wears a pearl necklace? Go up with, the, with his hands above his head. He does wear a pearl necklace? Is that a, is that a pearl necklace? I can't tell. I've seen him wear it, though. Maybe that's not it. It's like a, it's like a kid Cudi style thing, right? Like that's the hipster vibe now, right? I feel like it's a thing. Like it's like I don't care what your perception is of me. I'll do what I want. Yeah, the same guys paint their their fingernails and everything else. He does that too. Yeah, okay. He yeah, gets he gets vibe. his nails done with like uh, the French tips. Stop it. I swear. Really? As a distraction when he's when he's fight when you're fighting him that you he catches you like staring at him. He's good, man. He knows all the mental mind games. Okay, that that's uh, all weird, I guess. But um, I mean, I, like I don't judge. I'll just say I would never wear a pearl necklace. Me too. I would not do that. I got nothing against it. I'm still a guy who'd wear a gold chain, though, in the right set of circumstances. I'm not above that. Yeah, I'd, I'm not like, you hey, know, give me, flashy, get, but... Hey, give me uh, sponsored. I'll rock a gold rope. I'll rock the shit out of that gold rope. Jax? We're sponsored by Jax. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to see Odun wear a Never gold chain. turns green. <laughs> we gotta get Look him. how Arun's been sweating you know on it for six months. I want to get, <laughs> get Odun a gold chain with, like, a spinner. 
It's just like a, a, spinning a, wheel? A, a G unit spinner. <laughs> with the Ben and Jerry. Yeah, with kicks. the Ben and Jerry kicks. <laughs> Oh, We're gonna a turn great, you into that guy. That's a great visual. Yeah. Hey, do it for the show, man. All right, let's get into this review. Night one of me having a camera. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. We're gonna get him a camera. All right, this from Vic Ramirez, eighteen. The higher standard, five stars. Mm-hmm. You know I, why? I mean, expected, right? It's honest. He was that's being why. honest. Yeah, that's what he did. The higher standard is an exceptional podcast that is very insightful on a wide variety of topics. Wide variety, mm. not this, just the economy. Yeah. Sometimes we talk about. Manicures and pearl necklaces and UFC fighters. Coachella, microdosing tonight. Yeah. We mm-hmm. talked about LeBron. Cold plunging. Yeah. Odun's Chubb. Uh, this podcast is my new favorite, and I always find myself tuning in to the latest updates on both current events and the economy. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. Chris and Saeed provide a breadth of knowledge on topics ranging from the economy, credit, real estate, investing, and much more. You too, Arun. Yeah, you too. Just, he didn't say that, but we, we know that he meant that. He meant Thank it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. I highly recommend the higher standard for anyone wanting to become more informed on any of these topics. Let's get yachted up. Yachted up! You got to get yachted up. I haven't heard that in a while. I got to tell you, I felt really good about it. Yeah, I mean, feel, that, means, uh, that means he's been around. It means he's an OG listener. And speaking of which, I actually did want to give a shout out to one dedicated listener today. Uh, mm. I don't know if you caught it in the uh, stories on the Instagrams. I did not. But... Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go over to the higher standard on Instagram, which if you're not following, we've been a lot more active as of late. Uh, but uh, North Star Financials. Oh, what a stud this guy is. Uh, he posted my favorite finance and economy podcast. Started off with, I will teach you to be rich. Moved in all in. And number three, the higher standard. Clearly knows what he's talking about. Yeah, he did. He did give a disclosure, which is fair. Uh, the higher standard podcast lots of focus on u.s and global economy investing banking business and real estate laid back lots of joking around and laughs amongst the hosts mm. you know yeah. i feel I, like we're laid back i feel like he's being honest i feel like we're being honest and authentic ourselves and that is reciprocated right so thank you to that guy yeah and if you haven't done it go on apple or on spotify leave us an honest five-star review we appreciate it we share them with each other right away i feel like i'm always the first one to catch it that's not true the reviews Yes. Yes, but social media, if you repost us or share us, I'm the first guy to get that. That's true. That is true. And uh, Arun does some stuff around here, too. We just haven't figured out what that is yet. <laughs> no, he does a lot. Yeah, he does a lot. Yeah. Yeah, at least six hours of video editing a week. Yeah. Arun, validate me here. Yeah. I felt like he was waiting to say something. I felt like he was going to be a job. No, I was yeah. going yeah. to say something. I was going to say way more than that. Just that. You, I mean, you kind of downplay. He does just, you made it. I said at least it. six hours of that's video editing a week. Yeah, that's it. It's a very that's a baseline minimum. Mm. Uh, English second language. <laughs> yes. Just to be clear. <laughs> yeah. All right. We Damn. love you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Arun, do you want to say anything in there? You want to? I was just gonna say this is like a part time job for all of us. It really is when you think about it. The amount of work that we're putting into this show, full time, and not getting paid. Do we get to write this off as like charitable contributions? <laughs> we should. Do we get a refund for this, <laughs> right? So can I take my hourly wages now and then apply it to this, and then that'd be charitable contributions? A yeah. write off? You know, if you sponsor the show, it's technically a donation to a charitable organization, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Bye!